Welcome back, friends. Welcome back. It's time for another episode, a Forever Night episode. Forever Night Season 2, Episode 16, The Fire Inside. Oh, And we had actually just... Had we just watched this episode the other day? It was a few weeks ago. Yeah, I think I just put it on. But I have a very clear memory of this entire episode. Because it's a it's a simple... Yeah. It's a very simple episode. I mean, it's it's not an elevator episode in that we do have a fair number of sets. But it's not one of those episodes where a lot of time passes. We're not going right. to the precinct, going out. We're not asking anybody questions. We're not investigating anything. We're just... It's literally around. just pursuit. Yeah, it's pursuit the entire time. This is definitely one of those episodes where the flashback is far, far more interesting than the present day story. Yeah. I would watch a 1966 style episode where Nick helps slaves on the Underground Railroad. <laughs> like, I would watch the shit out of that. Um, I don't know that I have a lot of... I mean, I, of course, I... Feel for the plight of the people in the present day story, but it is not as compelling of a story as the past, as the flashback is. Right. But before we get too far, hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Matt. And this is... Come in, 81 Kilo. Forever Night podcast. Woo! Oh, dang, I didn't turn it off. Oh, there we go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is the quality, the quality you come to us for, right? Oh, yeah, we're we're tip-top production quality. Yeah, heck yeah, we are. Listen listen to that. Listen to how nice we sound. Our audio production assistant uh, missed the button press. Yeah, me. Me. It's because I have to like stretch underneath the microphone to hit the button. We're, we're in like an odd configuration. So I don't know. I blame somebody else. <laughs> I don't know what the theme of this episode is. I was trying to figure it out. And I think it's just fire bad. <laughs> fire. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> fire is bad or the Christo fascist superhero is bad. <laughs> well, both, obviously. Okay. But the Christo fascist superhero wielding fire. Okay. Wielding fire. It's, it's not the fire that's bad. It's the person using it. Yeah, I think that maybe gets the choice. like fire is the traditional weapon of all douchebags. Maybe that was the theme. Like, oh, I don't know. We don't like that guy. We should probably light him on fire in the past and in the present. Nick's like, oh, I've had people almost try to light me on fire before. Let me flash back. I know what it's like. I want to prevent these people from experiencing the same fate. Yeah. I mean, this isn't even our first uh, serial killer goes after the unhoused community episode. That's the plot of Dark Knight. Yeah. I mean, come on. That's a good point. This is low hanging fruit. (laughs) I mean, it's real. Like, they are targeted more than uh, the, the term is less dead. They are less dead, which is horrific, but it's. Like, they often don't have family. They often are hard to identify, or they go, no one notices when they go missing. The oh, same as far as like the pressure to solve crimes. Yeah, the same thing dead. happens with um, sex workers. They are often, uh, the, the term is less dead. And it's, yeah, hard, it's hard to say, but that's what, that's the idea. And so, I mean, that's kind of what we're going for is like, oh, this guy is, quote, cleaning up the streets. With a flamethrower. Okay. <laughs> Where did he get the flamethrower? Did he build it? Did he? Oh, I, you know what? He took the train to Detroit for the day, bought it at Walmart, <laughs> and then, then took the train back. Uh, he he got one from Elon Musk. Oh, yeah, you're right. Did, does he still have the flamethrower company? It was a limited run oh. thing. Well, in this 
in this universe, Nick arrested Elon Musk. So that's not even an option. Remember? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Well, anyway, we start out with the bad guy. This is a, like a, I don't know, this episode is not complex. The opening does not leave a whole lot of, the cold opening is basically, here's the bad guy, here's what he's doing. All right, let's watch them catch the bad guy, guys. Because bad guy, Christo fascist serial killer, the dragon, who we don't know his name is the dragon for quite a while, shows up and he throws some change down in front of this Right, like how person? much, how more demeaning could you be toward another person? And I mean, I get where they're going that this, he's, pl- he's preying on their desperation. But at the same time, I don't know that uh, anyone is going to risk their lives for 50 cents because he's standing there with a lit flamethrower. Right. This would make a lot more sense if the character had like a, another weapon. Right. Like People a, a generally have a stronger sense of self-preservation than desire to get. Well, okay. Most people would have a stronger sense of self-preservation than a desire to pick up the money for a cup of coffee half, or a cheap bottle of wine. Halfway to halfway to a cup of coffee. Well, this is the 1990s. No, he says it. He goes, oh, halfway he go, to a cup get of you coffee. halfway to a cup of coffee, bottle of cheap wine. Now, if you had someone who had an addiction to alcohol, the wine mm. might be might be a more believable, a more plausible draw. Yeah. But it it still comes off as really uh I don't know. Contrived? Yeah. Mm. Contrived. Yeah. I mean I I get where they're going. I do. I just don't know that this is my favorite portrayal of this dynamic. The... Oh, this is a horrible portrayal. Okay. Portrayal. Yes, yeah. thank you for validating me in that moment. I'm yeah. just like, I don't really know that I feel like like framing the unhoused community as this like so desperate for change. They're willing to turn their back on a guy in a balaclava with a lit a lit flamethrower just standing there like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, bend down and get it. Go on. Yeah, go on. That's fine. Yeah, go get it. Well, no, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, anyway, well, we'll just move past. We'll move past. Let's suspend disbelief about the whole premise of this. This guy. This is another episode like Hunted or Hunters, the one where we had the unnamed antagonist, mm-hmm. Renta Ann Foley, and they were just doing their shit in Toronto. We never got a name. We never got a real motivation. We never got a backstory. We never got like a, was this his first victim? Nothing. It's just like, all right, they burn this guy. They're screaming, wailing, and then intro. We go into the intro. And after that, we come back and Nick is interviewing the like beat cop that found that found the poor, unfortunate person who was the victim. The victim. The crispy cried for crispy fried victim. And she's like, <laughs> I love this line. She's like, I just heard that scream. You know that scream. The one where you know the person knows they're dying. Have you ever heard that scream, Detective? A scream like that has its own sound, you know? You hear it and your gut tells you right away that someone's dying. You ever hear screams like that, Detective? You're sure you didn't see anyone? And Nick is just like, yes. Totally well, dodges the um, question. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, lots, lots and lots and lots. But no, I'm not going to say that to you. Oh, yeah, God. Every time I was running after somebody, they just screamed like that. Yeah, it, it's so distracting when you're trying to eat hunt them. somebody down and when eat them. you trying to eat yeah. them, yeah. <laughs> that scream, man, oh. it just gets to you. Yeah, I know. It's like nails on a chalkboard. No, he's like, oh, yeah, uh, well, you might want to go see to your partner because your partner's like, Throwing up at a trash can in the back. Yeah. <laughs> and. <laughs> but then nobody saw, nobody has seen anything about where the guy went. Right. Well, they're like, well, who, where could he be? That's what Skanky it's says. A, Skanky's yes, Skanky's like, like. It's a pretty uh, conspicuous piece of hardware. Yeah. He's got like a fuel tank back ta- backpack and like a lit flamethrower wand. Where could he possibly be? And Nick is like, oh, yeah, the sewers. 
I have some experience using those to yeah, get from, around. Yeah, from personal experience, I know there's a sewer entrance right over here, right around the corner. Right. Uh, this way, Yeah, everybody. He just walks over there and he's like, mm, where does this go? And they're like, oh, God, I don't know, like service tunnels, utility tunnels, miles and miles of it. And one of them's Kanky or Nick is like, yeah, we know that there's homeless people living underground. And then they're like, oh, the mole people. And to me, this really feels like somebody on the writing team read an article about mole people, about people that live underground. And they were like, hmm, I wonder if we could work that into an episode somehow. Yeah. Yeah. This seems like a premise searching for a plot. Yeah. And so they're getting ready to go in because apparently these two detectives need to go in alone with one flashlight, no backup. Nothing. They get a ma- and, and radios that don't work and when radio. you get more than two levels down. <laughs> and they get a map, a good luck pat on the back, and they are off into the sewers. But my favorite part is we stop for a minute because Natalie is acting suspiciously. She's like, yeah, yeah, um, they died by fire. And Nick is like, do you have any other information? She's like, nope, I don't. I'll have to wait till I get back to like to, to work on it. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. So we're going to follow them down into the sewer. And she's like, Nick fire and he's like i know fire bad <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> the, the, Nat, I, I would say natalie's story here is the deepest character development yes oh absolutely and then after that is skanky right yes but nick is peripheral kind of it, he's there to be like oh there's stakes for the vampire character but be- stakes <laughs> <laughs> because natalie is like she takes him aside and she's like nick fire and he's like i know guys I don't know if you know this, but Skanky can die from fire too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Skanky is who is far... the braver cop here? Yeah, who is the braver cop here? It's Nick, always Skanky. It's always Skanky because literally everything in the sewer could kill Skanky. Um, the fire can kill Nick, but Natalie is like, "Oh no, Nick, are you going to be okay? Like, could you ask Skanky if he's going to be okay?" Not only that, but tomorrow he's supposed to go talk to his daughter's class. About his career. It's like career day at school. What happens if he gets like burned to death tonight and then tomorrow he doesn't go because he died on the job? Who has the bigger stakes here? Is it Nick or is it Skanky? Right. We don't even have any red shirts among the police. No. To like die to demonstrate the situation. No one goes with them. So they don't even have two flashlights. Right. They go. Uh. Well, they don't. <laughs> they probably did, but Nick was probably like, "Oh no, I don't need one," because he doesn't try to hide. He's no, a no, he was like, "No, it's cool. I could see in the dark." I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I ate a lot of carrots as a kid. <laughs> I got good eyesight. What can I say? So was, I have I have good night vision. I have good night vision, and of course, the second uh, once we identify the guy as the dragon, Matt pointed this out. I'm gonna let him make this point so that we can joke about it the entire episode. Please, please. Oh yes, us. yeah. He's the dragon, so it's very lucky that we have a knight to slay the dragon. <laughs> so it's even K N I G H T. Our knight is facing his fear to slay the mighty dragon because, as we know, that's it's probably the other premise looking for a mm-hmm. plot. Yeah, yeah, that and fire bad. Yeah, fire bad, somebody was killing like, people bad. Here's a good pun. What does a knight do? A knight slays dragons. <laughs> oh, we need we need a dragon in an episode, and then <laughs> maybe some of our viewers will get the pun. Yeah. And then we get our flashback, because Nick is like, oh, I remember this one time I was underground and somebody tried to light me on fire. <laughs> 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 and they they're going he and Jeanette and Lacroix go to this cabin in the woods we'll say a derelict cabin to stay the day which they arrive and it's already full daylight so okay whatever and Jeanette is like oh Nick we had so much fun last night I wish you would hang out with us and he's like thanks but like I'm good I don't I don't want to hang out with y'all at night and Lacroix's like fine whatever be a loser and then they open the they open the door to the basement. Uh-oh, there's people down there. And LaCroix's like, you assured me this would be empty. And Nick's like, yeah, I kind of thought it would be. It's sort of an abandoned cabin in the woods. It was an educated guest, okay? It's, a, it's an abandoned cabin with a basement. 
Yeah. And the only really annoying part about this flashback is that from this moment forward, LaCroix blames every fucking thing on Nick. He's like, this is your fault. I'm sorry. Did he invite these people here? Did he make this cabin part of the Underground Railroad? What part of the, this is Nick's there's fault? There's a difference between that when, when you talk about this happened because of this other thing, there's a difference between causality and responsibility. Right. Causally, yes. This is the result of Nick's decision. Responsibility, I don't think it's reasonable. Orange down. <laughs> Go ahead. Responsibility-wise, it's unreasonable to have ex- to expect Nick to have anticipated the Underground Railroad. Right. The whole point is that the Underground Railroad operated in secrecy. How was he supposed to fucking know that this was a hideout spot? He wasn't, but anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that because we have a lot of flashback interludes in this episode. Yeah. Um, probably because they were like, hey, otherwise it's just them walking around underground. Do we want to do the entire flashback as one continuous thing or huh. do we want to hop back and forth? No, oh, it's fun because then we get to talk about the fact that we are in a crisis situation and everyone has to keep getting Nick's attention. Nick. <laughs> Nick. That's a good point. This does keep <laughs> happening. They're in a life and death crisis situation. Yeah. And multiple times, like one one scene, Skanky's like, hey, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick whips his head around. Oh, yeah. Uh, what? Uh, yes. Sorry. Back. I, back. I'm I back just, now. Ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> On a related note, I saw a like an ADHD Instagram reel. And it was like, this guy's in a meeting and he's sitting there with like his pencil and pad of paper. And then the like boss, whatever is like, Hey, what do you think? And this guy's like, Oh, um, sorry. I was thinking about something else. Um, Oh, so you didn't hear what I said. Okay. Well, it, what were you thinking about? It must've been important. And he's just kind of like, uh, 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 okay. Uh, I was thinking that I haven't seen a mosquito in a while. <laughs> that's exactly and that's kind of weird. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this time I didn't see a mosquito. Yeah. So they go underground. We're underground. And we get this little chat from Skanky because we get some character development for three characters this episode and it's skanky natalie and cohen of all people yeah and so i would say skanky kind of adjusts i wouldn't say he resolves anything but no. he adjusts his kind of internalized and externalized um prejudice yeah about anyone associated with the sewers yeah, with the unhoused community. And well, like yeah. yes, and people who I don't know worked in the sewers. Because apparently his that, dad that was, did. That was the internalized yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah, I gotcha. So he talks about how he has this PTA thing at Jenny's school and they're gonna have to tell her whole class, sorry kids, uh Detective Skanky can't come in today. He was eaten by rats. <laughs> and Nick is like, would you quit it? Like, stop. (laughs) Because Skanky's like, they're not even going to want to talk. They don't want to hear from me anyway. Kids today have a very different definition of what makes a hero. This kind of harkens back to our false witness episode where Skanky was like, what is even the point? Like, one day we're just going to be done. And is anybody going to care? Is anybody going to care about what we did? Remember false witness for Skanky had that really weird, like, deep crisis of faith like existential crisis about what it means to be a cop and about what it means to be a hero and how how can you be a hero if you're not actually catching the bad guy but sometimes catching the bad guy means being the bad guy and does that make me the bad guy and um it's a little bit like that but really it's more just like they're gonna think i'm so lame because i kind of thought my dad was lame because my dad was a sewer worker and everybody called me like rat boy at school and he's like, I even remember this smell. He came home smelling like this every day. And Nick is like, will you stop it? Like, just quit it. Who cares if your dad was a sewer worker? I don't care. My dad was... Um, we don't even know. No, we don't even know. He's like, man, I fought in the Crusades. I'm like, doesn't get much my, worse than my that. My dad 
has been dead for 800 years. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm even, I'm not, I don't know. Um, I think we, we are about... Oh, oh, that's a spoiler-free life. Okay, so <laughs> then we go to Natalie. And Natalie is... this. Is, she's like sitting at her desk staring at the bag. Staring at the... Oh, yeah. And I recognize um, like task paralysis. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, okay, Natalie, just get up and open the bag. So she gets up and zips open the bag and she pulls out and it makes like a slurpy, crunchy noise when she lifts it up. But it's like props to the props guys. Yeah. Props to the props guys. Because this like seized, burned hand. Gross. Looks really good. That's gross. Yeah. It's sufficiently gross. It's it's a very effective prop. And she's like, oh, oh, oh." she sticks it back in and then zips up really fast. Like, "Oh, oh, 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 God, I can't. I can't handle this. I am appreciative of the fact that we get some some scenes with Natalie where she's not just blithely providing us with information. Right. But we know for a fact she unflinchingly opened a bag, opened a body bag that contained someone who'd been blown up by a bomb because we had a whole episode about it. So do I believe that Natalie is afraid of this burned corpse? Not even a little bit. They have retconned larger things than Natalie's phobia of burn victims. I'm almost certain she's even handled burn victims before. Because she's done the thing with the, like, mint gel, or is that another time? Where she puts it under her nose to get rid of the smell? I don't know if that was a burned body or if it was just an old body. Oh, okay. Yeah, so do I believe necessarily that she is completely overwhelmed by the thought of of autopsying this body? Not necessarily. Am I willing to suspend disbelief because it gets us character development and time with Natalie? Yes. Yeah, it's nice to see her not being hyper competent. Right. Her just being like, well, this not, mm -mm, I can't, you know what, I think I'm going to catch up on some paperwork think i'm gonna catch up on some paperwork because the next time we see her she's just walking around with a stack of folders like oh there's this stuff that i've been meaning to do and i'm getting around to it right now but then we go back and we see our the dragon i can't keep calling him the christo fascist superhero <laughs> vigilante justice douchebag um it's just too long so we'll just call him dragon um and he finds this lady who's doing laundry and he burns her and we hear her blood curdling scream and, and flame shoots up behind Nick and Skanky. Yeah. And they're like, ah! And so they go to try to find this woman. And, Which but of I course, fully expected Nick to just pull up the sewer grate, like <laughs> rip it out of the concrete, and then drop down. Yeah, no. And be like, Skanky, you go around back. Well, then we don't have time to meet our third character right. who roams around. Because they're lost, right? The map is not accurate. And they're trying to figure out how to get to where they heard this. But it's a maze. They don't know what to do. And their radios aren't working underground. So they're walking. And Nick senses someone following them. And he literally stops and goes, somebody's following us. Does not explain. No, Skanky, did you hear that? Oh, Skanky. Skanky's used to this. This is really interesting. This part I always find interesting. Because... He's like, okay, Skanky, you go down that way. And he points down this long, straight hallway. He's like, I'm going to loop around, and I'm going to get the guy that's following us. He doesn't explain it quite that thoroughly, but he's like, I'm going to go that way. You go this way. Okay. And clearly, Skanky's way is lit. It has, like, fluorescent light bulbs Mm -hmm. on it. But he takes the flashlight from Nick because they only have one flashlight. Yep. Almost as if he is aware that Nick doesn't actually need the flashlight. Oh, he knows 100%. Hmm. He's like, fine, but I'm taking the flashlight. You're on your own. I mean, you can say he's doing it because Nick is being the sneaky one. But at the same time, you're going down the lit hallway. The other guy's going down the dark hallway. What if he needs the flashlight? But Skanky knows he don't need it. So he heads off. And we hear, like, we finally see the guy that's following them. And it's like a, his name is Danny. We don't know his name is Danny for a while, but it's like this, he's supposed to be a young kid. I don't know. I don't know how old this actor actually was. I don't know how old. He looks like young 20s. Yeah. And he ends up 
like getting ambushed by Nick. Nick just leaps down from over a railing and tries to grab him and he runs off. And of course, Skanky gets like almost tackled, punched, because Skanky's always the one that like gets hit yeah. just before Nick gets there. That happened in Baby Baby too. He got whacked by a thermos. And Nick arrives and they like pin this kid to the wall and they're like, oh, we got you on assaulting a police officer. How do you feel about going to lockup tonight? Like they're immediately threatening. It's really interesting. But this kid is like snarky. He's like, yeah, sorry. I didn't realize you were cops down here in the sewers with the rest of us. And he just goes off. Every time they say something, he's like, fuck you. I don't believe you're actually down here to help anybody. I don't feel like cooperating. And Skanky is like, seriously, if we don't get help to find this woman or to find this bad guy, people down here are going to die. And Danny says, what makes you think anyone down here cares about living? Oof. Oof. And you hear like a faint heartbeat in the background because I get the sense we're supposed to think that Nick is like subtly pushing Danny towards cooperation. But in what he actually does is push himself back into another flashback. It's <laughs> <laughs> and this one I thought was interesting because they're talking to the two people that they found in the, the two escaped slaves that they find in the whatever cellar basement thing. And the dad says, you know, we ran away because they were going to sell my son down the river. This is actually still a turn of phrase where we live. And it means to be betrayed. Oh, man, he was going to sell me down the river. Mm -hmm. Hooray, rural south and the lingering effects of, like, long-term institutional slavery. I just wanted to point that out. I have heard that probably this week. Sell me down the river. And LaCroix is like, yeah, okay, I don't really care about your sob story, whatever. Um, anybody up for some lunch? And Nick is like, S fucking seriously? You just spent the night on the town. You're completely fine. Leave him be. And so LaCroix actually listens to him, which I find interesting, because that does not happen very often. No. He's like, okay, fine, but anything that happens is going to be your fault. No, it's not, actually. Laqu again, come on, Laqu again, I come back to, no, it's not. Also, I'm not sure how killing them would have resolved the situation. Everything that happens as far as people visiting the house was happening anyway. Yeah, it was going to yeah. happen anyway, unless they threw the dead bodies out right. at the people. That, the only life. thing they could have done is throw out the enslaved people. Right, and at that point, you don't know if they would have gotten harmed because they harmed somebody else's, quote, property. Right. So I don't know that that would have even resolved anything. So the fact that this is the angle that we went with for LaCroix's dialogue, it's not my favorite because it doesn't make a ton of sense. It just sounds like LaCroix being petulant. Uh, fine, but whatever happens, you're going to have to deal with he it. Was, he was gaslighting Nick on reflex. Yeah, just <laughs> on reflex. He couldn't help it. It just popped into his head, popped out of his mouth. He's like, oh, it's not actually his fault. While well, I'm committed to this now, I'm just going to have to keep saying it's his fault. <laughs> right, and I can't, change, I can't change how I'm framing this now because then – Nicholas would know that I, I changed my mind based on evidence. I can't have I him can't thinking have that. that. <laughs> and then we go back to the present and Nick is actually looking off at like a slightly oblique angle. And then he just like whoop, turns back to looking at Danny, which means he was talking to Danny. And then he just drifted off to the side. <laughs> <laughs> right. that, that's, I was visualizing that when we got back to the scene. I was like, oh, yeah, from Danny's perspective, Nick just drifted off for a moment and then came back and was like, Please help us. <laughs> you have to imagine Skanky covered for him. Like they were having this really intense repartee. Like they're really firing back and forth at each other. And then all of a sudden his eyes go slightly unfocused. And, he <laughs> and Skanky just side. starts wait, filling the wait. silence. No, wait. And then he's just like staring off to the side. And Danny's like, is he okay? And Skanky's like, give him a minute. He'll be back. Just a <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, but don't say anything when he comes back. I don't think he realizes that we all know he does that. And then he oh, goes, that that would have been a really cool, like, blooper reel. Yeah. Is, like, each season, 
but uh, like each episode you film like a blooper scene of Nick just staring off and then Skanky and Natalie and whoever's there just Covering kind of riffing yeah. while he's disassociated. <laughs> and then at the end of the season, you can have like a compilation yeah. of all of the the dissociation scenes. <laughs> What everybody does when Nick is in a flashback. Right, because we don't know how long these take him. We don't know if they're in real time. Oh, anyway. We end up getting some... Hold on. I'm okay. just imagining All right. uh, Garrett Wynn Davies practicing the, like, slack face, like, slightly more <laughs> wide open eyes look, like, that he makes, that, yeah. that he would make when he's in a flashback. Right. But... Uh, visible to everyone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we get from Skanky some casual discrimination. And he's like, hey, kid, have you never heard of a shower? Um, the por- Sh- the- Is shower in your vocabulary? Is shower in your voca- I didn't know vocabulary was in yours. <laughs> oh, everybody's just really, really burning each other around here. Oh, literally. <laughs> literally. So, yeah. Skanky's like, whatever, kid. Just don't stand downwind. Smart mouth. I mean, the. Do you know where you are? Do you, do you have like? A, do you have any compassion for this, other people, Skanky? He does by the end. By the end, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, this kid did just like gut punch him, so maybe he's a little bit sore about it. I don't know. I don't know. It 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 makes sense because it's Skanky's character. If Nick was the one doing this, I wouldn't believe it. Right. But it's Skanky's character. It's in character. All right. And then we cut to the precinct and they're looking at the map because Skanky's been trying to radio everybody and they can't get a hold of them, which means everybody is aware they are out of contact with Nick and Skanky. And Cohen appears to have learned at least some kind of lesson from bad blood because she's like, everyone, get everyone down there. I want them found. I want uniforms. If you can't get them on radio, we're just going to have to find them the hard way. Yeah. I want everybody down there as like, opposed to. Okay, Cohen. Good, as opposed to. Good oh, on you. We have good, hard evidence that this is where the serial killer lives. Pfft, two cops. It's fine. Skanky and an intern. Just send them. It's fine. Let her down easy when you don't find the bad guy. So, well, that's good. That's growth. And then we get our Natalie and Cohen emotional depth moment. First, we get two female characters who get to interact with each other. And not just not talk talking about, about the protagonist. Not talking about the protagonist. <laughs> Wonder of wonders. And it's Natalie and Cohen because Natalie walks in with her stack of folders and Cohen's like, okay, do you have like the dental imprint? Do we know who the guy was who got killed? And Natalie is like, yeah, I'm working on it, but I thought I would go ahead and catch up on some paperwork. And Cohen's like, Natalie, what the fuck is going on? And Natalie's like, I don't want to do it. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. I think I'm going to let the intern handle it. And Cohen's like... He needs the experience. Yeah, this isn't really something that we can, like, fuck around and find out. Like, we need this and we need it right now. And through the course of, like, a couple of scenes, we get, like, Natalie telling us this really intense story about how one time she was on vacation and they were stuck in traffic and the car ahead of them was on fire And people were trapped inside, and she can still remember the screams and the smell. Okay, I mean, that's suitably traumatic. I feel like that would traumatize just about anybody. Oh, yeah. And Cohen is like, okay, well, you showed your cards, I'll show you mine. And I, when I was young, an FBI agent, I was involved in a firefight. It was more like a war. It was so brutal. And my partner at the time was killed. And we never found the bullet that killed him. And evidence suggested it might have been friendly fire and it might have been my friendly fire. And I, when I came back on duty, I was paralyzed by fear. But you can't let fear paralyze you. You can't let fear of what might happen stop you from doing what needs to be done. And as the saying goes, keep your enemies close while fear is an enemy and you have to keep it close. Like you have to embrace it and work with it. Okay, great. Thank you, Cohen and Natalie. Hey, we got a great conversation. I would say Cohen conveys the moral of this episode, which is face your fears. Yeah. Much and, better than Nick does. And fire bad. Well, and he's fire a, bad. He's afraid of fire. So fire bad. 
I guess. Well, and, and in the flashback, he literally says, face your fears. Yes, you have to face. Yes, everyone's like, face your fear. I mean, it, okay. I mean, we hit the nail on the head a little heavy. That's why I'm joking about but it, about it being fire bad, because they're like, yeah. <laughs> fear is the mind killer. <laughs> like, we have to face our fears. Um, and we say it explicitly like a bunch, and which is fine. But again, who is actually facing their fears in this episode? Because Skanky, again, can die just as easily from fire as Nick can. Anyway, after we have this really emotional connection thing here happening between Natalie and Cohen, um, they find Maggie dead in the underground. And Maggie is the woman who is getting ready to do her laundry. And Danny... Danny finally believes. Yeah. Danny that Nick and Skanky are here to actually help. Finally realizes that they're not BSing him, that this is like a legitimate thing that's happening. It's horrible. And Nick is like, okay, Skanky, do you know what time it is? And Skanky's like, you going to go around? And he's like, yeah, man, I'm going to go around <laughs> somehow. <laughs> we'll meet back up in 30 minutes. Yeah, we'll meet back up in 30 minutes at the junction where three tunnels come together. Super specific. Really great. Um, I'll see you guys in half an hour. And then he runs off and he whooshes. Where does he whoosh to? He's flying really fast down the tunnels. It's faster and quieter than running. I guess. What if he gets going too fast? How fast can he take a 90 degree turn? What does that look like if you're flying really <laughs> fast and you have to go around a corner? <laughs> does he have to like slow down and pivot? Does he kind of swing wide and do like a... Or can he disregard inertia? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, we don't know how his flying works. Maybe there's... Maybe it's like a total. He can just... On the on a dime, no yeah. matter how fast he's going. I don't know. Inquiring minds want to know, how does flying in tunnels work? <laughs> <laughs> and Skanky's calling on the radio still. Still trying to, to reach somebody, anybody. And then this time he gets a response. And it's like, oh, yeah, great. Um, you know, we have you... We're on the way, you know, you're doing really good. Stay loose. And Skanky's like, stay loose. But of course, he hadn't didn't actually reach another police officer on the radio. He got the dragon. The dragon. And this is when Danny does his like he bangs on the pipes. We do this a couple of times. If that pipe doesn't go down, maybe they know what pipe goes down to where. Yeah, because he seems to pick specific pipes. Yeah, so that pipe would have to go to where... The people are. Where the people are. Yeah, because they end up... Of course, Skanky is always the one that notifies the family. I don't know why that is. But even in a subterranean labyrinth, somehow Skanky ends up being the one to notify the family. Because Danny takes him to where Maggie's um, husband lives. And, and child, obviously, because this is the... This is the emotional grab bag of like, oh, no, she had a family, which I was already sad. I didn't need that to make me sad. But thank you, I guess, for the effort. And he's hiding. So Danny bangs on the pipe to lure him out. And we get this yep. really sad line where he was like, oh, we were saving up money. We have, you know, we have family out in Alberta. We were going to go out there. It's really pretty. It's wide open. Not like our little sewer tunnel home that we live in down here. It's really sad. And mm -hmm. Skanky is like, oh, my God, you guys live down here? Like, you guys live with a baby down here? And I think this is when Skanky starts to realize uh, none, nothing about this is choice. Right. Nothing about this is intentional. This is a last resort. This is literally just last ditch effort survival. Yeah, basic survival. And that, hey, hey. Unhoused people, people experiencing homelessness, are people too? Huh, with the same wants, needs, and desires that other people have. And the only reason they are there and you are not is because some virtue of... Some of, circumstance. Some virtue of circumstance has led you to where you are. Huh, interesting. Almost as if having a dad who's a sewer worker is at least having a dad. Hmm. Is at least having a job. Is at least having a job. Is at least putting you Probably in a... Probably a union job that guarantees a certain level of pay yeah. and work-life balance. 
Yes. So he can smell his dad when he gets home because his dad is getting home before nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then we go back to Nick because Nick is whooshed enough that he found the bad guy. I have to imagine it was like a ping pong. (laughs) (laughs) And then then, just pathfinding through the maze. Yeah, exactly. And then he finds him and they have, um, they have a little conversation because Nick's like, Oh, sup, dude. The other guy's like, sup. And Nick goes, well, what's your name? And he's like, you can call me the dragon. Look, I'm a police officer, detective Knight. And you call me dragon dragon. Is that a first name or a last name? Job description. Hey, like life pro tip, life pro tip. If you ever find yourself naming yourself the dragon, (laughs) stop, seek therapy. Unless you have some real compelling reason to call yourself the dragon, you have either ventured wildly into toxic male territory or you're a Christo-fascist superhero vigilante asshole. That's a, it's a red flag. It's a red flag. When, when the guy said... They call me. I was like, Tater Salad. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a roll this episode. You were on a roll. But, you were on a roll. You were like, oh, because, it, uh, because it's, I don't know. Is it melodramatic? I'm trying to pinpoint the, why this is not my favorite episode. This is one of those episodes you waited a week or two weeks or however long it took for this new episode to air. You sat down to watch it. And when you got done, you were like, oh, that was underwhelming. Yeah, it, it, I think the the plot was a little shallow, and I don't, I'm telling you, the flashback is the most compelling part yeah. because he's in the middle of talking to this guy, and uh oh, he can't help it. He slips into a flashback. He disassociates for a second, and it's when the people hunting the escaped enslaved individuals um, arrive at the house, and they're banging on the door, and Nick answers the door. And they're like, this your house? And he's like, I'm here, aren't I? And they're like, can I come in? And he goes, well, you're the man with the gun, so I guess you get to say what happens. That won't be necessary. It's your place? I'm here, am I not? You look around? Well, you're the one with the gun. I suppose that means you do what you want. And so they come in and they're like, oh, this place is kind of shitty, isn't it? And he's like, well, I'm good at doing stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm handy. And they're like, "Um, are they here? You know. Who? He's like, who? And he ends up hypnotizing them. And he's like, they're not here. I think they headed up to Charlotte. Which means canonically, Nick's been in North Carolina. Hey, Hey. rural North Carolina. Rural North Carolina. He does say it's two days hard ride from here. So he could be in South Carolina because he said they head up to Charlotte. Yeah, up Charlotte way. Up Charlotte way. And it's two days ride. So depending on how far you're... I'm not getting into... Depending on what direction. I'm not getting into another land speed debate with you. Oh, we already covered that when we talked about how fast the unladen and laden vampire could possibly fly and whether or not that makes it feasible to have a vampire airline business where vampires fly you where and you can need to go. And can he go underwater? Yeah, we're not we're not getting into that again. I just choose to believe um he's still in North Carolina because that means canonically they were in North Carolina. Which what big city would they have been near? Maybe Charleston. Because clearly Jeanette and LaCroix don't slum it. They're not hanging out in some backwoods small town. They're in some they're near some metropolis of some kind. I know this is a debate we're not having right now. And then he comes back. Um and I guess I don't know, maybe the guy's been talking the whole time. Who knows? But he's basically like, I'm an exterminator, you know. And you know, when you want to get rid of the bugs, you gotta go for the nest. You got to get up underneath of them and burn them out. Sometimes you burn the building down. You know, it's a risk, but you just got to do it. And you can't, uh, you can't always take just the cancer out. Right. Sometimes you have to take a lung with it. Right. Wow, guy. Your, yeah. your metaphors. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Who hurt you? <laughs> Who hurt you? 
We won't know because this guy doesn't even get a real name. We don't even ever see his face. It's just a nameless, faceless bad guy that Nick has to overcome slay his the dragon. Fear, yeah, in order to slay. So he's like, gotta get the nest. Bye! And he goes to leave. And Nick's like, oh shit, he's getting away. So he pulls the door off and like runs after him. But the guy's waiting for him and he ends up shooting him with fire. Burns his arm. And his arm is on fire, and he's like, no, on fire! <laughs> okay, so <laughs> like, I, I have a question Okay. about vampire mythology. Mm-hmm. How dangerous is fire? Are the vampires themselves flammable? <laughs> like, fire is dangerous because why? Because it will spread across their body, or is it that they don't heal quickly from fire? What's the all right? What's the actual okay. danger there? So if we wanna, or is it the like mystical purifying energy of fire? So if we want to reference things that have happened to Nick previously that involve fire, we had the episode for I Have Sinned where he leaps over the fire to save that lady, and he is able to leap over the fire, stand in the fire for a few seconds, and then jump back over again, and. I would argue he faced his fear of fire then, but apparently it wasn't. You got to keep doing it. It's like rubbing over a rough spot. You have to renew that subscription. You got to renew the subscription to being able to be around fire, apparently. So he is able to do that largely unscathed. Okay. Also, I think it's in that episode where he confronts Joan of Arc and we get the part where he reaches for the cross and his yeah. hand like bursts into flame. Yeah. Well, clearly it didn't take his hand forever because his hand is fine. So we know he can be exposed to fire for a not insignificant amount of time and recover. We also had the episode where he clearly had been out in the sun and he goes to the like basement of that nunnery. And when he first arrived, he's burned. Remember, his face is like burned oh, from yeah. the sun. And very shortly after, it's healed. So we know he can heal from... I would say fire and sun are roughly equivalent. We know he can heal from that fairly quickly. So we don't have any real compelling evidence that fire is both dangerous and long-lasting in the Forever Night mythology. Maybe it just hurts. Maybe nothing else hurts, but fire actually hurts. And so yeah. what he's afraid of is just the pain of being hurt by fire. Maybe they're just over dramatic about it i think they're just being over dramatic about it okay i just wanted to yeah i don't know it varies in moonlight fire is like instantaneously fatal like they just turn to ash when exposed to fire like there's a scene where somebody's hand gets put in a flame and they literally just go and dissolve as soon as they're exposed to fire. the whole body that the part that was exposed okay. to fire so i mean that obviously would be like okay if you if you shoot a flamethrower at me, there's a very good possibility I will simply dissolve into ash immediately. Well, that would be shitty, but that's not what happens. His arm just lights on fire. He ends up taking his coat off. When we see him again, he's got like a burn mark on his coat, but he's clearly largely unharmed. So in Moonlight, where they like instantly combust, would a high-powered laser be the most <laughs> deadly weapon against <laughs> vampires? I don't know. There's a scene where we um, we assassinate. No, that's not the word. Ex no. What happens when you have legally sanctioned destruction of a instance of mind, let's say? Assassination. No, no. Legally, not assassinated. Oh, oh. Execute. E execute. Thank you. God, I was like, exterminate? No. <laughs> when you, they execute two vampires by just hitting them with a flamethrower. And that's sufficient to kill them. Clearly, that's not the case in this point. We don't, uh, we don't back it up. We don't put our money where our mouth is. We don't really feel the stakes for Nick for the fire. Right. Modern supernatural shows or sci-fi shows literally have someone on the, on the team that keeps track of all the the rules that have been established. I would be so fucking good at that job. <laughs> <laughs> and like sci-fi shows have like scientists for reference. Right. And supernatural shows have people who keep track of, oh, wait, 
guys, you're breaking canon here. Yeah. But I don't think that was a thing. This is just a good example of how in the 90s, I think I've said it before, but like right now, television shows are competing against an almost infinite number of television shows. And not only that, you're competing against a back catalog of television shows. On demand. On demand. When this aired, it was one of maybe six or seven things that were interesting in at the same time, time slot. At, in its time slot. And when a show aired, it was aired and gone. It disappeared into the ether. Unless it got syndicated. Which, when I was talking to um, Catherine Disher on eBay. Just kidding. <laughs> 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 I got my jacket. I don't know if anybody saw on Instagram, but I won a Forever Night cast jacket from Catherine Disher on eBay really exciting um i like don't ebay so it, it was like one of it was one kind purchase. Of a big deal. it was kind of a big deal and she messaged i messaged her to say thank you because of course thank you for putting this up and for offering it for fans and i just got a brief message back saying thank you and like i i'm always grateful to like syndication because it saved the show and got us the second season which i've said before and if a show got syndicated you got to rewatch episodes but if it didn't if it wasn't in syndication you didn't get to rewatch episodes. There was no competition. Nothing was driving people to have a continuously stellar television show. You can have a couple of bum episodes. People were still going to come back and watch it again. It was fine. And this is a very good example of every once in a while, they didn't try as hard. Yeah, they were just having a bad week. They're just, you know, maybe this wasn't as compelling, but it was written. It was done. All right, let's just go ahead and film it. We'll just, you know, we'll hit the nail on the head next week. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And I think that that's what this episode feels like to me. Because, no, we don't put a ton of effort into, like, why is Nick afraid of fire? Is it actually that? I think it's because he can die of it. Like, if he gets burned sufficiently, he can die from it. Whereas if he gets, he could get shot an infinite number of times and unless he happens to get decapitated by by the bullets, right. he's not going to die from it, you know. But fire can kill fire and wood and decapitation. So I don't know. He's not afraid of trees. <laughs> <laughs> he's not afraid of splinters. He doesn't have to face his fears every time he runs into a forest. Can you imagine? Wood is like the one thing that can harm you. And we've seen him just running through the forest with wild abandon. He yeah, could, could trip and impale himself. He has every reason to be afraid of forests as much as he is afraid of fire. Just putting that out there. Yeah. Yeah. But we come back because Skanky has, we also come back to the actual episode we're talking <laughs> about. Because Skanky has finished breaking the news to Maggie's family. And now they're waiting for Nick, and Skanky is worried about his friend. He's like, I knew we shouldn't have split up. I knew it. I knew I should have told him this was not the time to go around. And Danny, poor Danny, is like, dude, you need to lay off the caffeine. It's making you a little type A. You're not going to be okay if you keep acting like this. And then, of course, we hear Nick, and he's like, I've been telling him that for years. As he, like, walks down the hallway. <laughs> And uh, as always, great timing. Yeah. Immediate. He's like, sorry, I got tied up in conversation. And they're like, oh, my God, is your arm burned? And he's like, oh, that's just a flesh wound. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, OK, Danny, focus. Listen to me. Do you have anything you could define as a camp or a nest or something like that? And Danny's like, well, I mean, there's a no. 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 Nope. No. And if even if there was, I wouldn't tell you. Yeah. And Nick is like, listen, I'm, I'm not sure we have a whole lot more time to um, instill confidence in you, um, but this guy is actually killing people, as you are now well aware, and he's going after the nest wherever that he's is. He's on the hunt. He's on the hunt. So either you take us there or he gets there, but either way, like, we need to know where it is. And Danny's like, oh, fucking fine. And then we go back to the flashback, and again... <laughs> They are now surrounded. Okay, so he try, he ran the guys off. He convinced them that these guys had gone up Charlotte Way. Well, now night has fallen, and for some reason, LaCroix and Jeanette have not fucked off yet. They're all, like, hanging out in the cabin after night has fallen. I don't know why. They have every reason to just leave. Right. But whatever. Yeah. But anyway, the guy, the guy on his way up Charlotte Way found... The railway man. 
Yeah, I, I thought it would have been more clever to call him the conductor. <laughs> but I think, okay, so uh, hang on, I gotta refocus that. <laughs> so they're like, "Oh, I know you said they headed up to Charlotte, but guess who I ran into? The railway man." And they like throw this guy on the ground, and we have like a really long shot of this guy on the ground where he like rubs his head on the grass, and it's always weird to me because he less like does this like settling into the scenery. Yeah, the, the timing on the edit cuts. Yeah, so it's a little weird. weird. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, he said oh, that... Maybe, maybe that's the Euro Minutes. <laughs> that the Euro Minutes is this guy rubbing his head on the... Yeah, we ditched Euro Minutes. I don't know. Maybe they... It's probably because it was a different network. Yeah, or they more seamlessly rolled them in. Yeah. Yeah. So they end up... I don't know. They shoot the railway guy, but he got chatty before that happened. And now they know that these guys are in the cabin, so they're back to get them. And Lacroix is literally like, this is your doing, Nicholas. Again, and again, I say, not really. Um, Nick did everything he could to try to get these people to go away and not come back. Maybe if Lacroix had used his fabled hypnotism skills, mm. this would not have happened again. But here we are, and apparently it's Nicholas's fault, and Nick is like, yeah, okay. Which, I'm sorry, Lacroix, if you don't want Nick to feel guilty and to feel like absolutely everything is his fault... Maybe don't fucking gaslight him so much into believing that everything is his fault. What well, is that really what Lacroix wants? Well, he's always like, oh, you're being weighed down by this guilt. You got to let it go. We're not designed to feel guilt this way. You, you Maybe gotta that's let it what go. he's trying to like train. He's trying to condition Nicholas to, I'm sorry, <laughs> I used the full name because <laughs> I'm thinking from Lacroix's perspective. <laughs> Lacroix is trying to train nicholas to like build up the capacity build up the skill for just dropping guilt well then quit by, gaslighting by him. giving no he's giving him a whole bunch of yeah. things to feel guilty about and expecting nick to be able to just let it go like he does has he ever met nick he's working on him okay nick is a work in progress and, years, yeah. Yeah. And maybe this was how he developed the skill to just let things go was, you know, he experienced someone just throwing a bunch of guilt at him, throwing a bunch of blame at him. And he was like, I can't, it, this weight is unbearable. I just have to let it go. Oh, that feels great. Ah, I don't have to hold on to this guilt. Great. Okay, now, man, Nick Nick seems to be, like, really struggling with, like, holding on to the blame. I just need to overload him with an unbearable weight of guilt so that he can learn to just let it go. But Nick's capacity to carry a weight of guilt is probably much larger than Lacroix's. Yes. And so he's never, he's still holding it. <laughs> 800 years of guilt, of blame for all these little things. And, and Lacroix is still like, man, let it go. You'll feel so much better. I can't wait till we get to Curiouser and Curiouser. Okay, so back to the episode. I'm not going to comment because we're going to talk about that at length in like three episodes. Okay. Um. We're back in the sewers, and Skanky suggests to Danny that he call, use the telephone, you know, bang on the pipes. And he gives him his um, handcuffs to do it with. And, of course, Danny does. And then we see the dragon, and he checks which pipe the banging is coming from. And then and he follows it. Follows it, which means we inadvertently lead him to the nest. Which doesn't mean that he wouldn't have found the nest anyway. So it doesn't actually change the outcome all that much. It just means that the people are warned by the time he gets there. Right. And and probably it improved the situation because Danny says there's about 20 people down there. Yeah. And a couple of families. And when they actually get down there, there's like three people. Yeah. They, so they cleared it out. I mean. It was just the yeah. like immobile people. Right. If they hadn't done it. Probably 
he would have found it anyway, but everybody would have been there. So it ends up being like a net gain anyways. But they have kind of a chat. And this is where we get Danny's line about like, oh, yeah, Parents Day. I remember that. Teachers lie to your parents. Your parents lie to your teachers. That is if your parents bother to show up and they're not too drunk or high to get there. And Skanky's like, aren't you really too young to be so cynical? You got kids? What, is this a setup for a one-liner? Yeah, he's got a little girl. Her name's Jenny. Tomorrow he's going to make a real proud on Parents Day. Yeah, if I ever get done with this honeymoon cruise. Parents Day. Yeah, I remember that. Teachers lie to your parents. Parents lie to your teachers. They aren't too drunk or high to show up at all. Uh, who needs them? Hey, kid. You're too young to be so cynical. Yeah? yeah. Well, everything sucks, so what? Hey, Danny. Come on. This really matters to you, doesn't it? And to him, I mean, I can tell it's not just your job. It's... No, no, it isn't. How come? Now, you see, Danny, some people think that others are disposable. You live long enough, you find out nobody is. Uh, no, uh, no skanky. Are, are you listening? This is when I thought, oh, Danny is kind of like pre-generation, Gen Z, Gen Z. <laughs> He's just like, life is shit and I should just go ahead and die. <laughs> <laughs> like the uh, the meme I keep seeing is basically like, oh why why is why are like millennials and Gen Z, uh yeah you know, so cynical? Oh, it's because uh, we saw like thousands of people die on live television from nine eleven. Yeah, and literally everything's gotten worse continuously since then. Right. <laughs> yeah. We're not too young to be so cynical. We're, <laughs> we're just awake. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just for just for reference, on nine eleven, when it was like on lunch break, they had they rolled TVs out in the hallway, but like in the middle of class, the principal came over the loudspeaker and said, "America is under siege." <laughs> you look back on that day now, and you're like, "What the actual fuck was happening?" I was in a class. And everyone was, something was happening. Of course, at the time, um, schools did not allow phones. So you couldn't have your cell phone in class at all, period. Um, they were just regular phones at that time. It's not like they had smartphones or anything. But um, like there was a rumor was head spread among the cucumbers, so to speak. And so my teacher stopped class and he was like, look, something's happening, but we're in class right now and I don't actually care. So we're going to finish class. So we finished class, and then by the time I got to the next class, I think the second plane had hit the second tower. Mm -hmm. And I was, my teacher actually had it on TV, and she was just sobbing uncontrollably. And I had not caught up. Like, I hadn't been watching it like everybody else had, because my previous teacher was like, it's fine. It'll be on the news later. <laughs> it's totally cool. And I just remember being like, holy shit, what is happening? Because no one was explaining anything. And I'm in 10th grade. I'm not, you know not worldly enough to realize like this is a very significant like cultural shift that's about to happen but anyway <laughs> um yeah we're older than we sound i guess i don't know everybody knows we're old right you guys know we're old like we remember 9 11 like we were in high school in high school yeah. yeah but this is when nick is like you know what some people because like danny is like why is this guy doing this like what the fuck oh you know this I may be cynical, but I don't believe that we deserve to be burned to death by fire. And uh, Nick says, you know, some people just think that some people are disposable. But if you live long enough, you realize nobody's disposable. Which is really Nick's whole thing. Right. Nobody is dis I don't. Nobody's disposable. Nobody's worth. Nobody's not worth anything. Everybody has some sort of inherent worth. And then I don't. If I continue to act as if they don't. I'm the bad guy. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. the dragon is the bad guy. That's a good, that's probably a good summary of Nick's internal morality. Right. And like the, the pillar holding up his dedication to not um, frivolously feeding on people. Yeah. Because nobody's disposable. And then we go back into the flashback because of course this 
puts them back into it. But it whoops Nick's back and Nick, god damn it, Nick back into a flashback. I just had it. My tongue wasn't working. And this is when LaCroix and Jeanette are like, the fire's almost to the roof. We have seconds. We have to decide what we're going to do, Nick. Like, he's not holding you here. Are you fucking chained? You could have left. Just go. This is why LaCroix would never turn me into a vampire. Just going to put that out there. Be like, oh, it's not my fucking problem. You do what you want to do. But anyway. LaCroix and Jeanette are like, come on, we got to go. Let's go, Nick. They're going to be, I mean, it's fine. I'm sure this situation will resolve itself amicably for at least one party. Maybe them, maybe them. I don't know. Who cares? And um, Nick is like, no, I'm I'm going to stay. I'm going to try to save these people. You guys can go if you want to. So, of course, LaCroix and Jeanette do the, like, eye change before they leave. Where LaCroix, like, runs over to apparently the part of the of the, the roof weak part of the roof. Yeah. And then he turns and is like, come on, Jeanette, let's go. And so Jeanette and them are both standing there with their like vampire eyes, which is now visible to the people, the other people in the in the building with it, them. It's just the firelight reflecting off of their eyes. Is it? Because then they fly up out of the roof. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, whatever. <laughs> they which, leave. Why do they have to like huddle together? I don't because Jeanette's dress is so heavy. I don't know. I don't know. They do. Jeanette always takes off with somebody. I don't know. Maybe she just objected. Maybe she's just not as good at flying. Well, she has to fly in, like, petticoats. They get to fly in pants. She has to fly. Can you imagine? What if she? What if there was a strong, like, tailwind? <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to blow up around her head? I don't know how this shit works. Well, how, anyway. Anyway. My point here is these people are gathered around watching this building on fire and two people just took off out of the roof. I was like, did they not see them? And Matt goes, well, maybe there was a lot of smoke. (laughs) There's a lot of smoke. They're not looking at the roof. They're looking at the doors and windows. I think the funniest part of this is LaCroix and Jeanette just very clearly did something supernatural after after a full day of like debating whether or not to eat these people in front of them. And then Nick does his like whoop, like head whip turn back towards them and then walks over uncomfortably close. Do you know how fucking terrified these people probably are? These monsters showed up. First, they've already had to escape this life because um, one of them was going to get sold down the river. Ugh. And they're waiting patiently for the railway man. And three people show up. Three white people show up. Three well-dressed white people. Three well-dressed white people who are not even human and immediately start... And two of them speak with French accents. And immediately start discussing the merits of murdering them. Not... No, 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 no. Eating them. Eating. Eating them. Eating. Eating them. Then they have to spend the entire day with these people because they don't leave. They all hang out in the basement together. So they had to spend all day with these people... Swapping stories? I don't know. Who knows? I, that would. This, that's why I'm saying this would be a better episode than the episode we actually got. And so then they emerge to find out that the railway man has been captured and killed. And they're about to get burned to death. And the very obviously supernatural creatures that mysteriously showed up vamp out and then fly off through the roof. And the third one stays and does like a... Like I mean, and gets real close and, and makes eye contact. Real close and makes eye contact. I'm just saying, this is a very terrifying moment for these people. But that's why he says, "Just kill us now before the fire gets us." Yeah, he's like, "Can you just go ahead and do it?" Because this is getting like, uh, you can only stay terrified for so long, and then finally your body's like, "Fuck it, let's just die." There's fight, flight, and then fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> And depending on where you stay in all three, you know, I think they went from they couldn't really fight. They couldn't really flight flight, literally. And so now they're in fuck it. But then we come back. And throughout all this, Natalie and Cohen have been unfurling their like personal recollect. God, my tongue. I'm going to. <laughs> They've been unfurling their personal recollections about that time that they were afraid it would have been funny if we'd gotten extra flashbacks, like flashbacks of Natalie in a car, flashbacks of Cohen as a young FBI agent. That but, would be, that would have been interesting, an interesting spin, yeah, like, twist on the show, yeah. And then Cohen gets to leave her little zone of influence, 
Ooh. And go to Natalie's little... Natalie's center of power. Her little estrogen island. Did she have to, like, carry a talisman from the office to make it over to Natalie's office? That's what I want to know. She's like, sorry, if I leave this 12-foot radius, I wither and die. Like the guy, like the bad guy from um, Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. Like the knight. He has to stay in that room. If I cross the seal... I will die. Yeah. So, so sorry, I'm, I was uh, the the fight or flight has been expanded. Oh, okay. I just expanded it. <laughs> Look at that. Well, it's it's appropriate. <laughs> uh, but I was, <laughs> I was listening to a like uh, recorded lecture on YouTube, and the guy says, uh, "Yeah, you know the four F's that we learned about in psychology class: fight, flight." Freeze and sex. <laughs> and sex. And sex. <laughs> <laughs> so literally, fuck it, I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, you missed my joke about does she have to carry a talisman in order to make it over to the another zone of estrogen, which is um, Natalie's little office? No, because she's accompanied by... Natalie. Oh, yeah. It's like... Cohen um, does get out sometimes. Like, fey queens. Mm. Like, you are protected by my mantle of power yeah. when you're coming to my domain. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's exactly what it is. But they walk in, and this poor intern is, like, struggling with the body under the sheet. And Natalie's like, oh, did you manage to get that dental implant? And he's like, ah, shucks. I just can't get <laughs> I it. I just can't get a clear one. And I was like... How how is that hard? It's not like the guy's moving. Uh, so maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the maybe problem. Maybe he is moving. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? I don't know. I'm not a medical examiner, but I feel like teeth impressions would be the thing that interns do. Like, hey, can you mix up this compound? Squeeze the dead guy's jaw for like a second and then pop it out. Thanks. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. Then we go back to a flashback because Nick and Skanky are on their way to this nest. Uh, emotions are high. And as usual, Nick can't help but like disassociate during critical, critical moments like this. And he remembers when he saved. He actually ends up saving the people that were in the building with him, the boy and his dad. And he's like, we have to face off fears. So he like wraps the kid in a cloak and knocks down the door and jumps out. And then he runs up to just one guy. He doesn't dispose of any of the other people. The guy with the gun. Yeah, he runs up to the guy with the gun. He, like, hisses, does his vampire thing, hisses at everybody as, like, a, look, see, shit got real. And then he kills the guy. But not, he, like, kills the guy with his teeth. Which? Hmm. How long ago was that? How long ago was that? Huh. I don't know. It would have been more than 100 years ago. It would have been more than 100 years. What is 18... When's the Civil War? 1840s. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, that would have been more than 100 years yeah, ago. Yeah, so it would have been more than 100 years. Can you look up the J dates of the Civil War? Because I sounded really dumb just then because <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Sorry. I have more of an encyclopedic knowledge of fictional things. You think I'd know literally every house around us is flying the Confederate flag. I'm looking up the Underground Railroad. 1800 to 1865. Okay. Yeah. So it's within our, it's outside our 100 year range. So it's cool. He killed this guy. And the dad is like, thank you. You know, like, thank you, whoever you are. Whatever you are. Whatever you are. And the boy's like, come with us, mister. <laughs> like, come over the river. And, and the dad's like, shh, shh, shh. This is when you're like, stop. What, stop. Kick, it, kick it his leg? <laughs> Don't do it. And Nick is like, yeah, thanks. I really wish I could, but I can't. And the dad's like, oh, shucks, mister. We're really going to miss you. Flee into the woods, child. Flee into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and this is when Skanky does his Nick. Nick. And whistles to get him back. And then we get to the nest and we realize nest, camp, whatever. And we realize that, you know, most of the people are gone, which is great. And the bad guy's there, which is bad. And Nick and Skanky actually take a moment to strategize. This is the most strategy. Well, 
technically tactics. Yeah. This is the most tactics that we've seen them use. Yeah. In that to they coordinate had, their activity. They had a brief conversation. Okay, Skanky, you line up your shot. Make sure you don't hit his tank. If you hit one of those, it could explode. And then they split. So Skanky goes off to try to find his shot. Nick goes off to find, try to find his shot. And yeah, I mean, they creep off as Dragon is like, I'm going to find you. And he's trying to lure everybody out. Got some change. Enough for yeah, half a cup of coffee. Yeah, reuses the same reuses line. the same line. And then he sees Skanky. I wonder if they reused the same audio clip. Like if the guy didn't speak and then they were like in post editing. Oh, they, they very like, well could have. Oh, uh, he needs some dialogue here. Right. Because he sees Skanky and he's going to like fire at Skanky. And then Nick has to overcome his fear and draw the dragon's attention. So he's like, over here. And he like jumps out and the dragon whips around. And then they have kind of a standoff. Where Nick is standing there with his gun, and he's, like, seeing fire, and he's like, I don't know, maybe, here's the sense I think we could go with if we really wanted to make this make more sense, which is maybe he has, like, an overwhelming instinctual fear of fire. Mm. I mean, like, I can die by fire, but I don't think about how I can die by fire every time I'm around a fire. Right. Like an animal might. Like, right, but hum- humans are attracted to fire, but maybe vampires, part of the transition is to add this instinctual fear. Maybe. Maybe it's like a visceral, you cannot overcome it, or you, you have to work to overcome it. Like, you are literally, instinctually, overwhelmingly afraid of fire. Not that fire does that much more damage to you, just that you have this, like a fear of heights, a phobia. You have a phobia of fire. Mm-hmm. And so he has to face this phobia because, of course, Skanky can die from the fire, too. And so he has to do what he can to try to save Skanky. So he jumps out. They have this kind of standoff where Nick is just like, Ugh, like trying to stay in the moment, but also like flashing to like things on fire. And he lowers his gun and he waits for the dragon to try to burn him with the flamethrower again and then he like whooshes he uses that to cover his supernatural speed right and as soon as the fire dissipates nick is gone and he like shows up behind the dragon and we hear like a crunching sound and then he falls down oh yeah i'm pretty sure nick snapped his neck yeah yeah but he didn't kill him with his teeth he didn't kill him with his teeth i don't know if he's i don't know i don't know if he just like maybe like hit him on the side of the head and knocked him out yeah it would make more sense for him to knock him out unless Skanky's going to have to get real, real creative. Well, then um, in his report. So, you know, he shot Nick with the fire and then he tripped over an extension cord. And on the way down, his chin hit the corner of a box and it broke his neck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it. sometimes that would make more work for Skanky, so... Maybe he was taking pity and he just knocked him out. We don't know. We don't know what happened to him. Well, in this case, it would be Natalie doing the autopsy. And yeah. she could cover for Nick, too. He's really, really lucky Natalie figured out who he was. Or this would be real, real hard. Yes. Because we've had some pretty sketchy-ass murders where she had some very legitimate questions and he would not have been able to answer them. But that's it. We're done. He's caught. Whether he was caught dead or caught alive, we don't know. Because we don't have any kind of a wrap-up. I mean, we don't have a wrap-up of this particular storyline. We have two kind of wrap-ups. One for Skanky and one for Nick. And we have Nick's, or Skanky's wrap-up is at the precinct. Because, of course, he has the P, the PTA thing where he was going to be doing the father, daughter, whatever. And so he brought the kids to the precinct. And he's like, you know, he's talking about his job as a cop and... Just trying to be real flowery and, you know, frame being a police officer in a positive light. And he's like, you know, but Jenny. But not in an entertaining way. But not in an entertaining way. Because he's like, you know, Jenny would tell all you guys all of this if she wasn't out with the mumps right now. It's not the cleanest job in the world and it doesn't pay all that well for the work you do. It's, it's dirty and thankless. My daughter, Jenny, your classmate, would uh, back me up on that fact if she wasn't at home with the mumps on her dad's big day off, but <laughs> that's another story. Anyway. Show us the jail. Yeah, show us the jail. 
<laughs> I love. Which is the running I gag that love they how, never show up in the show. I know. I love how consistent we were with that. I have no problems with that. I think that is amazing. The fact that we never, ever meet Myra or Jenny is just perfect. Because then they get to be tension, but they don't have to be a face. They just right, get and to they be... Can get to, they get to be whatever the viewer imagines them to be. Right. Exactly. And they end up shouting like, we want to see the jail. Take us to the jail. And then Cohen shows up and she's like, listen. And they all stop talking. Yeah. She's like, you're losing them. <laughs> yeah. She goes, Officer Skanky is a hero. He saved a lot of people last night. Pay attention here. Detective Skanky is a hero. Last night he helped a lot of people stay alive. Is that right? Well, yeah, I, I guess that's right. Why don't you talk to him about that? And Detective Skanky, Skanky is like, mm, yeah, I guess I did. Okay, so who wants to go see the jail? Because Skanky's not in it for the external validation. Skanky does it for the internal validation. I, I respect this. The fact that being called a hero would make him feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, He's fine with knowing who he is. He, he doesn't he need does, other people to know who he is. He does crave some amount of validation because he has a wall and it would be nice to have a plaque on it. Right. He just wants to be known for being a good cop. But right. he doesn't... He doesn't want to be a hero for specific deeds. Right. But he isn't a good cop because he wants to be known as a good cop. He is a good cop and he wants other people to realize it. He doesn't... One doesn't follow the other. He isn't performative. He's focusing on the sizzle, not on the steak. Exactly. Exactly. And then we have a wrap-up with Natalie... Which, guys, I think we need to check in with Natalie. I don't think she's okay. She's rearranging Nick's gas fireplace with a fireplace poker. <laughs> this fireplace gets turned on with a remote control. You don't poke those. There's no logs in There's there. There's no logs in there. This is not a real fireplace. And those logs have to stay in a specific configuration. They're the heat sink. You yep. can't move that shit around. The fireplace won't work properly. And she's like poking it with a fire poker. And you know Nick is sitting there like, just let her do it. It's fine. She needs this moment. Mm -hmm. It's like when she was burning paper in her own gas fireplace in yeah. her apartment. <laughs> <sighs> this is, come on. I know we don't keep track of like su supernatural canon. I, okay, fine. Like I, I'll, but honestly, can we just remember that his fireplace is not a real safety. fireplace? <laughs> yeah. Can she can be sitting by it? She doesn't need to be poking it. That's not a necessary detail. It's like the the knot elevator. Okay, I mean the knot elevator is the knot elevator. We could have put a line of black electrical tape or something across it, so at least it looks like right, it's a like platform that can floor. move up and down. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like there's a gap. Yeah, I mean, come on, guys. Anyway, and that's really our wrap up. And Natalie's just like, you know, I'm glad we both faced our fears. I faced my fear of burned dead people and you faced your fear of fire. There's one more wrap up. Is there? Skanky's taking Danny to a baseball oh, game. Yeah. Can you believe he's never been to one? Uh, this, I don't know. Maybe I blocked that out because to me, okay, that feels performative. Hey, if Danny shows up, can you let him know I'm here? I'm going to be his new adoptive dad. I'm going to take him out and do dad shit. Um. No, I, I can, this seems, okay, as someone who kind of grew up with Boy Scouts. Okay. This is a very, like, Boy Scout dad thing to do. Boy Scouts and no dad. But, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm not kidding, but I'm also kidding. Yeah. But the, like, when. Uh, it's a when, male mentor -y thing to yeah, do? Yeah, it, it's okay. just a, it's a male role model thing. That you don't just, it you don't only do these things for your kids. It's, oh, here's other children, like, in my sphere of influence that that may be lacking a male role, role model. Okay. And, you know, socially, culturally, that's that's been a thing. Yeah. It's only, like, you know, in the last hundred years or so that, like... American culture or Western culture has really narrowed everybody's activity down to just the family. Yeah. Like as a, as a s smaller community, any 
any like adult male would fill in the role of yeah the father figure or whatever and so it's it's totally reasonable to me to see skanky say oh here's a kid who is lacking this and i can literally like make his life better yeah i can teach him like how to be a better um you know masculine figure in society right okay all right i accept your explanation Maybe that's just because sporting events were only used as a, oops, I'm sorry, thing. Oh, okay, yeah. In my life. Yeah. Yeah. Like one time, I think my dad, like, maybe hit my hand or something, because I think I didn't close the toilet seat or something really stupid. And, like, it made me cry because I didn't like that. Who likes that, right? And he was so upset that he'd made me cry that he took me to a basketball game. He was like, he came in, I was like crying in my bed. He was like, do you want to go to a basketball game? Like, yeah, okay, sure. And I remember thinking, I hate basketball. I don't want to go to a basketball game. That sounds like the most boring thing I've ever done. But it'll make him feel better knowing that he did something to try to make it up It's a bonding experience. Yeah. So maybe that's why I'm just like, oh, okay. He's he's saying he's sorry by taking him to a baseball game. Like, sorry, I told you you stank. Uh, Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of making up for the damage that he's done. Um, I guess. But also providing him with experiences, giving him a reason to feel like life is worth living. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. All right. Well, I guess we'll leave it there. So in conclusion, fire bad, but face the fire. And maybe you won't have to face the fire again for another 20 some episodes. Foreshadowing? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm talking about how he faced he faced his fear of fire and crosses, ironically, and for I have sinned. And gotcha. then now we have our, hey, did everybody miss that episode in the first season? Don't worry, we'll recap. Fire bad, but Nick can overcome his fear of fire in order to slake his thirst for justice. And slay the dragon. And slay the dragon, literally. Maybe literally. Maybe just incapacitate the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really clear that up. We don't really clear that up. I don't know. I think we talked long enough about this episode. It wasn't no baby baby. Let's put it that way. Yeah. It was fine. It was good. It's fine. I like to see this episode. This ah, I like this series. I don't know. I've said that like a million times, but I feel like it's good to reiterate when we have an episode where we're like, meh, meh, meh. Every once in a while you have a meh episode. Every once yep. in a while you have a meh day. It's perfectly fine. And this is something that I think we as Like, well, we're elder millennials. God fucking damn it. I hate saying that out loud. But we're elder millennials. And I think this is why we are a little bit more lenient in the way we view television shows. Where, uh, like, a lot of, like, my niece, for example. I mean, every single episode has to hit. And it has to hit hard and it has to be brilliant and you have to feel like the pace is building and the plot is building and the characters are building and blah, blah, blah. Whereas we're, we can handle some peaks and valleys. I can be like, damn, that was a great episode. Meh, that was, that was like a, it was okay episode. That's fine. I'll watch it in the next episode, you know, because we were more used to like some episodes were just perfect, like partners of the month great episode i have gotten so much mileage out of no eat in the last week now that matt knows what i'm saying when i'm like no eat um great episode this episode meh, is a valley that's all right yeah maybe we'll peak next week we'll, we'll show up and watch it anyway because the other alternative is like the five other things that are probably not sci-fi fantasy or horror so oh yeah on on tv in the 90s right yeah Yeah. so anyway i guess we'll leave it there again all right until next time friends until next time Bye. bye